welcome. Good morning to another service, another online service from United Methodist Temple. We are very encouraged by um, the words that were sent and the greetings that were sent last week with Pastor Nikki's first service and we're grateful. We're also grateful that you are continuing to be faithful in your uh, giving. Remember that the um, post office box is the address that you want to use, but we're very grateful for that. And stay safe. Remember to wear your mask whenever you do anything. Whenever you go to, if you go out to the grocery store or um, go out to eat or just go for a walk, whatever. Remember to wear your mask. I will be putting mine back on, which Jim says will be an improvement. Well, he should look in his mirror, huh? Anyway, stay safe. Remember, we love you and we'll see you soon. Now, let's enjoy today's service. <laughs> 
of praise. It comes from Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe thy righteous ordinance. I am sorely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to thy word. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me thy ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from thy precepts. Thy testimonies are my heritage forever. Yea, they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform thy statutes forever to the end. Amen. Join me in prayer this morning. God of the universe, we come to worship this morning, longing to set our minds on the Holy Spirit, to live with Christ within us. We have not always made room for Christ in the clutter of our lives. We have indulged our wants so often that too often the voice of the Spirit is drowned out. As we dedicate these gifts this morning, may it help us to live more in tune with the Spirit and to use our resources in a way that reflects Christ is Lord of all our lives. We pray especially this morning for those in our church community who are sick, lonely, or hurting. We pray for those in the hospital or recovering at home. We pray for those that are homebound particularly during this time of extended quarantine. And we pray for those who are hurting today in any way, big or small. May these persons feel your grace and love with them today, and may they know that it is with them always. In your holy name we pray, amen. And now, let us pray together the prayer Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture this morning comes from Romans 8, 1 through 11. This is from the Common English Bible. So now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. God has done what was impossible for the law, since it was weak because of selfishness. God condemned sin in the body by sending his own son to deal with sin in the same body as humans who are controlled by sin. He did this so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now, the way we live is based on the Spirit, not based on selfishness. People whose lives are based on selfishness think about selfish things, but people whose lives are based on the Spirit think about things that are related to the Spirit. The attitude that comes from selfishness leads to death but the attitude that comes from the Spirit leads to life and peace. So the attitude that comes from selfishness is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law because it can't. People who are self-centered aren't able to please God. But if you aren't self-centered, instead you are in the Spirit, 
if God, in fact, God's Spirit lives in you. If anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Him. If Christ is in you, the Spirit is your life because of God's righteousness. But the body is dead because of sin. If the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your human bodies also through his Spirit that lives in you. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. to me, as I'm getting started as your pastor here at United Methodist Temple, it might be helpful to let you know how I got here, how I ended up as a pastor in the United Methodist Church. You see, I didn't know as a child that God was going to call me to be a pastor, and even when I did hear God's call, it wasn't an automatic yes. It was a choice. I actually grew up in a Baptist church in rural Kentucky. And so I remember when I was 14 at a youth retreat, I was watching my youth minister's wife pray for one of my friends. And I sensed that God was nudging me to do that someday too. And at the time, I had no idea what that meant. Did it mean to be a youth minister whenever I was older? Did it mean to volunteer with youth when I was an adult? And at that time, I never really came to a conclusion about what that could have meant. And I made the choice to put that experience and that call on the back burner. I went along with middle school and high school and off to college, not thinking too much about it. But then God had other plans. You see, in college, I could never settle on a life plan. Some days I wanted to go to law school. Others, I wanted to be a farm broadcaster. And yet others, I thought being a college professor sounded like a good idea but nothing ever seemed to fit right. One day, I was sitting in my then fiance, but now husband's living room, contemplating changing my life plan again. When out of nowhere, Travis, he says to me, have you ever considered being a pastor 
because something tells me that it would be a good fit for you. Instantly, I thought back to that 14-year-old experience, and it was something that I had never told him about. All the pieces fit together, and I knew what God had meant then and what God meant now to go to seminary and explore ministry. But in the end, I still had a choice to choose to say yes and go to seminary or to choose to say no or not yet and pick an alternate path. And as you can see, I made the choice to follow God's spirit and go to seminary. And while that's a pretty drastic example of making a choice to follow God instead of doing what might be easiest or what I thought was best, you know, we don't all have something that drastic that we have to choose or intense, but we all do make choices. Whether we like it or not, whether we realize it or not, we are all bombarded with choices each and every day. Even though most of the time we do not realize it, we are given many opportunities each day to choose between, as this passage in Romans describes, the Spirit of God or our own selfishness. I mean, just think about it. Perhaps we wake up and we put on the news and we have a choice of how we can react and respond to the people, decisions, and situations that we hear about. We go out to run a few simple errands, and we have a choice of how we treat others on the road beside us. And then we get to whatever business we're going to, and we have an endless number of choices on how we're gonna act, how we're gonna interact with other customers, how we're gonna interact with employees. And to top it all off, if you're on social media, you have an endless amount of choices of how you will respond to what others say and do when you are typing instead of conversing with someone face to face. The choices are endless and the temptation to follow our gut reaction, to do what we think is best, to follow our own selfishness, as Paul says in our scripture reading today, is strong. So over the next three weeks, the lectionary is going to take us through Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul is describing what being in Christ means for a Christian. So over these next three weeks, each Sunday, we're going to explore together a different aspect of what being in Christ means for us today. This Sunday, we'll see what being in Christ means for our own selves and for our own choices. Next week, we'll see what being in Christ means for our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, and our relationship with all of creation. In the last week of June, we'll talk about what being in Christ means in regards to our prayer life. But for today, we'll explore what Paul has to say about that impact of being in Christ means for our own selves and our own choices. So let's start by backing up a bit and talking about the book of Romans as a whole. The book of Romans was one of many letters that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to early Christians. This one was written, unsurprisingly, to Christians in Rome. Specifically, Paul was addressing a church that was deeply divided. The emperor at the time, Claudius, he had expelled all Jews from the city of Rome, which caused Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians from the area to be separated and doing their own thing within their own communities. So when, at this time, Jews were able to re-enter the city, the church was unified, but it was not a happy reunion. Instead, conflict about what it meant to be in Christ ensued. So in this letter, Paul is trying to explain to the Christians what it really means to be in Christ, what it really means to follow Jesus. And in this chapter specifically, Paul is talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit and how it can and should have an impact on us as Christians 
The Holy Spirit can and should have an impact on how we live our lives and what we do when we're faced with those choices that we encounter every single day. I picked the Common English Bible as a translation for today because I really love the choice of words here and how they create this picture of what it means to follow our temptations and gut reactions versus what the Spirit of God would call us to do. It's this idea of being in the Spirit versus being selfish. The word translated selfish here is actually the Greek word sarkos, and it's often translated as flesh or body. But the choice to translate this as selfishness in the CEB, it emphasizes an important part, point. We can't be separated from our body. Think about it. If we focus on this passage from Paul about being on focusing on our body versus focusing on the spirit, we can fall into this trap of seeing this more as a philosophical argument or something nice to think about versus a call to action. We can make the easy mistake and the one that we are all guilty of about drawing a, about drawing a clear distinction between what it is of the body and what is of the spirit. What we do at church or as Christians on Sunday versus what we do in our personal lives during the rest of the week. We can think that the answer about being a Christian, that the answer to setting your mind on Christ means getting as far away from your body as possible getting as far away from your normal life as possible, getting as far away from the rest of the world and your normal life as possible. But again, in reality, we just simply can't do that. We can't divorce ourselves from our own bodies. We can't escape our everyday lives. Even for those of us who do accept the call to go into ministry, and make it your profession, whether on a church staff or as a pastor or even as a monk or nun, we still have to live and work and breathe in the real world of our everyday life. We can't simply ignore our ordinary bodies and our everyday lives and just wait until we get to heaven. And that's why the idea of translating this word as selfishness struck me. It reminds me that the goal of focusing on the spirit, the goal of Christian life, it is not to avoid our bodies and avoid the daily grind. Rather, it's to make the choice as often as we can to focus on God's spirit and work in the world rather than choosing to follow our own ways and our own selfishness. To be spirit-centered versus self-centered in all that we do. It reminds us that each and every day in our ordinary lives, we are faced with a barrage of choices, sometimes big, but often small. And the goal of the Christian life is to walk with and walk in the spirit, to make spirit-filled choices versus our own selfish choices. Just think about the examples that I gave earlier. What would our lives look like if we immersed ourselves in making spirit-centered choices? You wake up, you put on the news, and you decide to pray for the people, decisions, and situations that you hear about, even if, and maybe even especially if, you disagree with them. You go out to run your errands and make the conscious effort, with God's help, of course, to respond with grace rather than road rage. And when you get to whatever business you're going to, you make spirit-filled and grace-centered choices in how you act, how you interact with other customers, and how you treat the employees. And to top it all off, for those of us that are on social media, what if we made the effort to make spirit-filled and grace-centered choices on how we interact with others on those platforms 
knowing that there's another child of God on the other side of the keyboard, especially when we disagree. We can't fix the world overnight, but what would it look like if we take Paul's words to heart here? What would it look like if our lives were based on the spirit versus selfishness? Imagine the difference that that could make in our lives, our community, and perhaps even the world. While this all sounds great and wonderful and easy to do on the surface, when the rubber hits the road, we realize that there are still some questions that we need to answer. How do we know what the Spirit-filled choice is? How do we get the power and the insight to make that choice? I mean, if making Spirit-based choices versus self-based choices were always obvious or always easy, our world would look drastically different than it does today. Well, lucky for us, Paul gives us the answer. Look back, starting in verse 1. So now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And jumping to verse 4, now the way we live is based on the spirit, not based on selfishness. It is the spirit of Christ himself that gives us the power to make the spirit-based versus self-based choice. Trying to make the spirit-based based choice using our own power and knowledge, it feels impossible. But lucky for us, we don't have to. We are only able to make the spirit-based choice through the grace of Christ at work in our lives. But again, the practical question remains. How do we rely on the grace of Christ to help us make the spirit-based choice? Well, I think John Wesley, the father of Methodism, he has a good answer to this. You see, Wesley coined his three simple rules for Christian living. Do no harm, do good, and attend upon all the ordinances of God. Now, I know that last one, it's a mouthful, so I like the way that pastor, bishop, and author Reuben Job puts it. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Now let's jump into what each of these could mean for us today. Do no harm. Such a simple, yet powerful command. We like to try to think that we try to be good people, but what if we took it a step further to do no harm to others, to make spirit-filled choices that avoid bringing harm to other people, whether intentional or unintentional, to focus on living out the sacrificial love of Christ that does no harm to those we encounter through our spirit-centered lives. It's a seemingly simple, yet life-altering thought. Do good. Again, this is a simple concept, living a spirit-centered life by doing the rule of doing good. But it can be a life-changing shift. Think through all the choices that we make in a day. How often do we, when faced with all our choices throughout the day, how often do we think about what would do the most good for others? How often do we seek the betterment of others over the betterment of ourselves? And what would our world look like if we did? Stay in love with God. While this is the final command, I would argue that it is the most important. This concept means staying committed to growing in our love of God and love of others through our spiritual practices. This means staying committed to things like prayer, scripture reading, worshiping together, even virtually, serving others, showing generosity, and sharing our faith. When we do these things, they help us stay connected to God 
and learn how to love God and to love others better. It is through these simple yet profound practices that we can learn what the spirit-based versus the self-based choice is in any situation and grow in our ability to make the spirit-filled choice. So now, that is my challenge to you this week. Do no harm and do good by staying in love with God. You might find it helpful to put these words on a card or a post-it note that you place somewhere you will see often this week. Maybe that means putting it on your bathroom mirror so you're reminded to say a prayer as you're getting up and getting ready for your day. If you're still driving often, maybe it means putting it in your car so you're reminded to treat others with a spirit-filled kindness when out on the roadways. Maybe you would put yours in your Bible so you're reminded to look for ways to live out the verses that you read. And maybe, if you're on the internet often, maybe you could put it on your laptop or make it the background photo on your phone. That way you're reminded to do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God, particularly in our digital interactions with each other. While you may not make a huge life-altering choice like my decision to go to seminary this week, you will no doubt have many choices that you will encounter, big or small. I challenge you to approach these choices and make the spirit-centered, not the self-centered decision. Do good and do no harm by staying in love with God. Let's close in prayer together. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of Christ and the gift of the Spirit that allows us to make choices that do no harm and do good on behalf of others. May you empower us as we go forth to live in such a way that increases our love for you and our love for others more and more. Now hear the benediction. As you go this week, live spirit-centered lives. Do no harm, do good by staying in love with God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.